Dear Fellowship in Christ, Wakeman here. I hope you don't have to face the fiery tribulations I'm going through. However, in case you do, pray about it. Today, while in prayers, I was touched and inspired by the Holy Spirit to read the book of Job. The experience from praying and reading the book of Job has allowed me to understand what Lucifer was trying to do in my life. Like a typical narcissist, he was trying to gaslight me with helplessness and despair to influence me to focus on the suffering, rather embracing it as a blessed learning opportunity from God. At that moment, I realized that I could resonate with Job, rebuking Lucifer with his lies and deception. I finished my prayers thanking God for all the long suffering I'd been through for decades and offer it as a living sacrifice to God to save on this day as many souls as possible who were opening their hearts receiving and giving their lives to Jesus Christ. I hope this video and message encourages you to remain in the Word of God and on the Gospel of Jesus Christ, not on the suffering, which gives an opportunity for Lucifer to kidnap your soul. God bless you. Please, remember, Jesus Christ is the truth, the way, and the life. There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then answered Satan, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. The great question in the book of Job is this. Will Job's experience triumph over his theology? Or will his theology triumph over his experience? Now that is a very relevant question, even today. When some experience, good, bad, or indifferent, comes, Will my theology triumph over that experience? Or will that experience triumph over my theology? First time we meet Job in this book, he's a man compassed with blessings. He's got seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she asses, he had a very great household, and the Holy Spirit himself says he was the greatest, the greatest of all the men of the East. It was a day and an age when one's material prosperity was an indication of one's spiritual prosperity. You see, a man compassed with blessings, had everything that heart could desire. And he tells us himself later on in the book, he tells us that he never looked with lust, that he was a father of the fatherless, a friend and helper of the widow, that no stranger ever escaped his boundless hospitality, and that he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Even in a day before the giving of the Mosaic law, this man Job knew enough about the true and living God to allow his farms and fields to have their Sabbath rest. A man compassed with blessings. But the second time you see Job, you see a man crippled by bankruptcy. There's been a crash on Wall Street. He's been wiped out. It was an absolutely disastrous day. He sat in his office and one by one, uh, this one, that one and the other one came, knocked on the door with bad news. 
First of all, he learned that all his oxen and all his asses grazing on the nearby fields had been carried off by a bunch of Arab brigands. He sits down in his office and makes a journal entry and writes off some of his liquid assets. Not too worried. You can always get some more donkeys. And then he, he learns that uh, there has been a tremendous thunderstorm. The thunder roared and the lightning blazed. And all his sheep, 7,000 sheep, all been burnt to a crisp sits down and writes off some more of his liquid assets. He's beginning to wish he hadn't got up this morning. He's hardly put down his pen before somebody else comes banging on the door and he's got some bad news. You know, Job was still a very rich man. He still had 3,000 camels. That's like having 3,000 rigs on the road these days. Still had 3,000 camels scouring across the fertile crescent down into the exotic markets of the distant east to bring the wealth of the world into his warehouse. He was still a rich man, but now comes this disaster that his camel caravans have been raided and all 3,000 of his camels have been plundered and swept away. Job was bankrupt. Sat down, made the final journal entry of the day, went back home to his house and, and said to his wife, we're, we're wiped out. I got nothing left. It had been a dreadful day. A man crippled by bankruptcy. Next time you see Job, you see a man crushed with bereavement. He's still got seven sons and three very attractive daughters. They decided that he'd get his daughters married off and, and set his sons to work and recoup his fortune. And then they decided to have a party in one of their homes and Job had got to the age in life where the more his sons and daughters went out feasting, the more he stayed home fasting. He loved his children. He was concerned about their spiritual welfare. He put them under the blood in the Old Testament way of doing that kind of thing. And all of a sudden comes the terrible news. There's been a tornado. And it has swept right through the house where they were staying. They're all dead. Every one of them. But I see poor old Job as he makes his way up to his bedroom. Flings himself on his face before God. He says, oh God, it doesn't make any sense. Why did you have to take them all? I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. But I love you just the same. He still have, has one thing left. He's still got his wife. And any man who has a wife who will stand with him in the storm tides of life when the strong tides lift and the cables strain who will kneel with him in prayer and share his burden he has a treasure beyond the price of ruby but all of a sudden job's wife breaks down and you see a man cursed with bitterness crippled by bankruptcy Crish crushed with bereavement, covered with boils. Imagine, from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, covered with great putrefying sores. Can't lie upon his bed, can't stand up, can't, can't endure the pain in his body. Every part of him hurts. Doctors come to see him, shake their heads, and Job says, what is it? They say, we don't know, Job, never seen anything like it. You think I'm going to get better? Haven't any idea, Job. Now, it's not in the medical textbooks. We don't know what it is. No, can you give me some medicine or some ointment? Well, we can give you some. It probably won't do you any good. Well, what am I going to do? Well, you'll just have to put up with it. 
And now at last his wife turns against him. And she says to Job, she said, why don't you curse God and die? Did it ever occur to you that that was the voice of the devil? That is exactly what Satan said. Satan said, you take the fence away, you let me get at him, and he will curse you to your face. And now Mrs. Job, she says, why don't you curse God? And die, why don't you curse God and commit suicide? You'd be better off dead. And he quietly put her in her place. You see a man in the hands of Satan. Now, of course, Job didn't know this, but his life had become a stage. And down upon the stage of his life had come two great protagonists. And all heaven above and all hell beneath watched with bated breath the titanic struggle for this man's soul. I tell you, there was not a spot in the galaxy of greater interest during this week than the land of Uz, south of Edom, west of the Arabian desert, reaching down towards Chaldea. And there wasn't a created being in the universe who was being more closely watched and scrutinized than poor old Job. And he triumphed gloriously. Satan was absolutely defeated. He retires from the conflict in utter confusion up in heaven. They ring the joy bells and sing the hallelujah chorus. Down in hell they gnash their teeth for rage. And Job has so triumphed over Satan. Satan is so gloriously defeated by Job that you never hear his voice again in the Old Testament. Job shut him up for the entire Old Testament period. That's how he faced calamity. Even as he s stood there in front of those ten tombstones with tears running down his cheeks, all he could say was, The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Triumphed gloriously. And the man who has faced calamity so gloriously is now going to face some criticism. And he isn't going to do so good. All, the, 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 all that happened to Job, you know, in the, in the second phase of the story is he just got upset. Now, first of all, I have to introduce you to these three friends of Job. Job happened to look out of the window, and he saw these fellows coming down the highway towards his house. First there was the Eliphaz, and then there was Bildad, and then there was Zophar. Eliphaz is the fellow with the, maid, with, with the exotic experience. Uh, he, he's the man who will talk to you about ghosts and visions and dreams and thrills and chills up and down your spine. Brother, if you haven't had my experience, I don't expect you saved. And then there's Bildad. Uh, he's the man with the clever cliches. He's the kind of fellow who's got a pet proverb or a pet answer for everything. And he likes to go around with this, these pat answers of his stabbing people with Bible text. Have you ever met people like that? Oh, well, that was Bildad, see. Well, then there was Zophar. He was the man with the made-up mind. He's Mr. Know-it-all. He knows what God will say, what God will do in every situation. He's got an absolutely monopoly on God. If you want to know God, you've got to come to him. Well, these three people came to see Job. The first to speak was Eliphaz, and he, he suggested that Job had to be a sinner. Behold, he says, thou hast instructed many. But now it has come to thee, and thou faintest. Remember, he says, remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent. I've seen that they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. And here's a nice verse for you to put in your collection. He said, Behold, happy is the man whom the Lord correcteth. 
Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. That was Elijah. He suggested that Job was a sinner. Bildad, he didn't suggest, he supposed that Job was a sinner. Oh, he says, doth God pervert judgment? If thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would wake for thee and make the habitation of thy righteousness prosperous. What you been up to, Job? What you been up to? And then there was this fellow Zophar. He was the worst of them all. He was brutal and callous. He doesn't suggest or suppose. He says that Job was a sinner. If you got what you deserved, Job, you'd be burning in hell. What a terrible thing to say. Mind you, Job responded, sometimes in anger, sometimes in agony. He turns to these fellows on one occasion. He said, you fellows, he said, you fellows, you forgers of lies, you physicians of no value. Oh, that you would all together hold your peace. It should be to your wisdom. You fellows, he said, if you would keep your mouth shut, somebody might make a mistake and think you were wise. Sometimes not, not just in anger, but in agony, he comes pretty close on a couple of occasions of saying some very wicked things about God. He, he said to God on one occasion, thou art become cruel to me. Didn't I give him that was in trouble? Didn't I give to him? Did not I weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? When I looked for good, then evil came. Which really means, he said to God, why can't you learn a lesson from me? Look how I treated people. Why can't you treat me like I treated them? Why can't you learn something from me, God? Now we see him finally in the hands of God. The thing is that everybody in this book is wrong. Job was wrong. His wife was wrong. Eliphaz was wrong. Bildad was wrong. Zophar was wrong. The reason, of course, for that is they didn't have all the facts. So foolish to criticize people because we don't have all the facts. Let's notice in closing how he was rebuked. God came and said to Job, I'm going to ask you some questions. I've been standing around listening to you, Job. You've had a lot to say for yourself. I've been listening to you. I'd like to ask you a few questions. You seem to know it all. Question number one. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you, Job, before you were born? Can you bind the sweet influences of Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Job, do you know how that... You see that particular star clustered up there, that nebula as you call it? That Job is Orion. That is a true star cluster. All the stars in Orion are actually part of a, of a unity and they all are tied together by invisible bands and the whole system moves together across space by invisible bands. Uh, can you unloose those bands, Joe? So that the various stars that make up Ur uh, Orion disappear in different directions and you come back a year or two from now and it's gone. Can you do that? Well, let me ask you an easy one. Do you see the, the eagle on that rock up there? Tell it to get up. Does the eagle mount at thy command? No. Well, there it is, you see, Job, he said. You don't know how I run the material universe. How can you possibly know how I run the moral universe? And Job said, I, I abhor myself. I repent in dust and ashes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I said far too much. Then we're told how he was released. We're told that the Lord turned again the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. 
And it says that the Lord turned again the captivity of That is, he unlocked the door, let Job out of that prison. When? When he prayed for his friends. When he got down on his knees before God and said, Oh God, I'm sorry for what I said about those fellows. I'm sorry for what I said to those fellows. Lord, I'm terribly sorry, but they are my friends and I ask you to bless them. And all of a sudden, Job was out of prison. Nothing had changed. There were still ten tombstones just outside the window. His body still hurt from head to foot. He was still broke and bankrupt. His wife was still unhappy. But Job was out of prison. And he was again able to rejoice in the Lord and in, to sing and praise God and give thanks in spite of everything. He was released. Last of all, he was rewarded. The Bible tells us that God gave Job double. And God is a careful bookkeeper. He keeps books with great precision. In chapter 1, Job had 7,000 sheep. In chapter 42, he had 14,000 sheep. In chapter 1, he had 3,000 camels. In chapter 42, he had 6,000 camels. In chapter 1, he had 500 yoke of oxen. And in, in, in chapter 42, he had 1,000 yoke of oxen. In chapter 1, he had seven sons and three daughters. And in chapter 42, he had... Oh, oh dear. There's a mistake. Seven sons and three daughters. Oh, dear. The liberals are right. There's a mistake in the Bible. Dear, oh, dear. God can't count. Oh, God's made a mistake. Throw your Bible away. Oh, dear me, no. No, no, no. No, there's no mistake. You see, he'd lost his sheep. And he'd lost his camels. And he'd lost his oxen. They were gone. So God gave him double. <laughs> but he hadn't lost his sons and daughters. He knew where they were. And if you know where something is, it's not lost, is it? And so God gave him the same number of sons and daughters. And by and by, Job died and went to heaven. And, and in the process of time, the last member of his second family died and went to heaven. And Job stood up in the presence of the angels of God and counted 14 sons and six daughters. How good is the God we adore, our faithful, unchangeable friend, whose love is as great as his power and knows neither measure nor end. Blessed be God. Amen.